And I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Russ Taylor. And uh, I, I first met Russ when uh, many years ago when I was at Cal U. And I uh, was very impressed with, at the time, he was one of the first people to think of using robotics to get involved with orthopedic surgery, which has since been very successful. And he's gone on and done a whole lot more things that I think he's going to tell you about. Now. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, I, one of the most fun things, I, summers I ever had was a sabbatical I took from IBM where I was up here uh, uh, doing configuration motion planning in, a, in an earlier existence. Um, before I start, there's the usual uh, disclaimers. Uh, I should really emphasize that I'm going to be talking mostly about work from Johns Hopkins, and I've been involved personally with a lot of it, but by no means all. I'll, I'll try to make appropriate acknowledgments as, as I go along on the slides. But uh, it really is important to realize this is the work of many people. Um, generally, uh, what I've been interested in for many, many years are, are systems uh, that involve a three-way partnership between people and machines, sensors, robots, things like that, and information fundamentally change processes. It, earlier it was manufacturing processes, but for about the last uh, 25 or 30 years it has been primarily in the area of interventional medicine. Um, Neville mentioned uh, RoboDoc. Uh, this is the system. And what we did is we planned uh, uh, an orthopedic uh, uh, surgery uh, from CT data. Then we used a robot uh, to very accurately prepare the bones to receive the implant. And it, it made quite a difference. Uh, and one crucial thing is that you knew what you did. It was much more predictable. Here's some more recent work. Uh, again, this notion of information enhanced surgery. I'll be talking about this more later. But what we're dealing with here, uh, yeah, it's, it's a way to get the light off the screen. It might help people see some of the movies a little better. Yeah, if you could kill the other one, it would be even better. But so, uh, and, and I'll talk more about this uh, system later. But underneath, um, we have a picture like this. I, I put something like this together 25 years ago to explain to my bosses at IBM why an information company should care about something as exotic as a medical robot. And the idea is you start with everything you know about the patient. A lot of that is in the form of medical images, but more and more we'd like to include other things like genomics, clinical annotations, and the like. You push all of that together into something I'm calling a model. It's basically a data structure that lets you do the other things you want to do, which include diagnosis and treatment planning. But crucially, we can take all of this information into the operating room and register it or relate it to the physical patient. Then we can use a variety of technology to help the surgeon do what was planned to be done and verify that it was done. Well, I'm an engineer, and to me that's control loop, closed by information. Now, I've described that as if it were uh, uh, through an entire treatment cycle, which could be a matter of weeks. But in fact, if you notice that picture is the same up in the upper corner, and that reminds us that that same information process really occurs at many time scales down to every second in the operating. So what we have here is an in, our information-driven systems that let us treat each individual patient in something of an optimal manner with less invasiveness, greater safety, maybe greater precision, maybe something that we can't do without the assistance. But it is patient-specific interventions made possible by technology. Well, in addition, in manufacturing, we, we also realize something that is also true here. We have machines involved in all of this process, and all of those machines are helping us be consistent and also generate data. There's no law that says we have to throw that data on the floor. We can save the data. We know what we did, and we're consistent. Eventually, I know the outcome, and I ought to be able to relate those to improve my planning processes. So this is computer-integrated medicine, or it comes to, it, computer integration comes to interventional medicine. 
So it really is, to me, the synergy between these blue loops and these red loops that in the future is going to drive changes in the way patients are treated. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, for a while is first just talk about examples from these blue loops. And uh, there's much more than, I had to cut back a two hour talk to try to cram it into about an hour and we have a late start. So I hope I can do something. Let me just very briefly just give maybe one or two examples in the <coughs> top part here. Um, one is some recent work uh, that one of my students has been doing. This slide here is um, uh, actually the work is a little older than that. Uh, but it relates to that crucial process of how do I relate all these images and these models to physical reality or the images to each other. And for us medical imaging people, we refer to that as registration. And uh, here, one specific example is we want to use ultrasound to register back to CT images. Uh, and there are a number of, of examples of doing that. Um, the, still, the standard method that is most commonly used in practice is something called iterating closest point, where what you do is you have a bunch of features and you try to find on a surface model corresponding places or features and then you move them together and keep iterating. The basic assumption there is that the closest point is the most likely corresponding point. But it's not actually that, that good a, uh, uh, a, a predictor. And uh, so what Seth has been going back and saying, well, if I can characterize the actual probability of a match and take account of noise in my sensor data and prior uncertainties, can I improve these point pair registration methods which have a lot of advantages in terms of just, they can be very efficient. And uh, I'm just gonna show one example and primarily to make a point. And what he's doing here is he says, okay, if my feature includes orientation with uncertainty and position with uncertainty, uh, I can uh, make another objective function that is a bit more complicated and optimize on that and find optimal matches. Now, if he does that, uh, here's a, a simulation study uh, that he did. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details. I mostly want to make a point on, on these next two charts. Uh, it is true that first he's, he's able with his method, which is the blue value, these are failure rates and these are errors, to be more accurate. And that's very re reassuring. But one of the other things that's a bit, if you're going to use a registration and an intervention, the most important thing is when the algorithm is done, it should know whether or not it's accurate. And so if you look here, uh, this is sort of the standard method. If you look at the error, this is the match error, and this is the, the actual error. Well, there, there are places where the standard method, or I, do I have this backwards? This is the match error, and this is the actual error. He says, okay, I think I'm done, but in a significant number of cases, it's wrong. Uh, here is Seth's method. Uh, here is match error. And you notice that when it thinks it's converged, it basically is correct. And that is important. Uh, one other just quick example, uh, coming back to his use case, he's been looking at ultrasound registration. Here's one study where he's been looking at uh, a combination of you have what's called point pair matching up on the proximal femur and that on the shaft um, looking at uh, ultrasound and, and if he does that he's able to get uh, very robust submillimeter uh, errors uh, matching. Uh, here's just one other example in this imaging and planning. This is some work uh, that uh, colleagues uh, Chad Gordon and Marilyn Armand have been doing. Uh, it's face transplants. If you have somebody with a completely shattered face, what they do is they go out and find a cadaver and actually will transplant both the soft tissue and the hard tissue to match. And uh, 
It's quite an elaborate planning process. I don't want to talk about it here. There involves very interesting problems of statistical modeling to kind of predict what that previous phase should have looked like and uh, some technology for doing the uh, osteotomies. But uh, I mostly just wanted to give an example uh, of the, uh, the sort of thing we, we do here in these modeling and planning uh, parts. Um, if we look now at the, uh, at the robot, this is a robotic seminar, so I'm mostly going to be here talking about the robots and not the image. Uh, one of the dominant things uh, that is done broadly, uh, you can think of it as needles everywhere. You're trying to put a thin needle or therapy delivery device accurately on an anatomical target that you've maybe identified in preoperative images or you have some images to guide your placement. And there are many, many, many examples of this. Uh, we have at Johns Hopkins, his other work here. Uh, uh, there are many, many such systems uh, with different sorts of image guidance. Um, I'm just going to give a couple examples. Uh, here's some work that came out of our engineering research center. It's actually a collaboration uh, with, with uh, well, this one is with the medical school uh, at Hopkins where what you're trying to do is place radioactive seeds very accurately into the prostate under a combination of ultrasound guidance and sometimes x-ray um, guidance to help you see where you've put the seeds. Uh, there's a problem yeah. with that. Um, it's very hard to actually see the seeds in, uh, in, in ultrasound. Uh, this is a B-mode image of the prostate, actually a remarkably good one where you see the seeds. Uh, if you use uh, photoacoustic imaging, uh, this is lightning and thunder. If you shine a flash of laser light through the tissue, uh, the seeds absorb it and expand and give off uh, a shock wave, which you can detect in an ultrasound image. And uh, as you can see here, you get much better contrast. And you can see where you put the seeds. Now, this is important because you've stuck this needle into the prostate and left these radioactive seeds behind. But you think you know where you put them, but because the needle's down, the prostate moves, and then so the seeds can migrate after you let go of them. They're not where you think they are. So what you have to do is you have to know where they actually were, because you may have to go back and correct for a cold spot that you've left. Uh, just a couple other examples in this needle guidance. This is a really clever uh, product uh, that Iman Bachter and Greg Hager have commercialized in a small company. Basically, you have an ultrasound probe with a video camera, a stereo video camera, and it looks at a freehand needle. And what that can tell you is just with freehand ultrasound, you can say where that needle is pointed. And this can with minimal impact to the workflow, help a physician accurately uh, place, a, say, a biopsy needle on a target in something like breast cancer. Um, this, what I'm showing here is a terrific collaboration that we've had with uh, people at the Brigham uh, over many years, uh, and that's uh, MRI guidance. Again, I'm using prostate needles and ultrasound. And here we have an MRI compatible robot uh, for, for placing needles accurately under MRI guidance. The advantage of MRI is you can see the cancer much better. You can see the tissues much better. And otherwise, the, the same basic workflow is what I showed before. I, I apologize. I'm going very quickly. I thought uh, for this talk, rather than go real deep in one topic, I was going to kind of give people an overview, but stop me if there are questions or I can take some at the end. I, I, I have no idea how long this talk is going to be. Uh, surgeons don't actually like all these robots and technology getting in their way unless they really give you an advantage. They really like to work interactively uh, just with the patient here. But a lot of the support we can give them is ways of providing better information. And so what we have is what our system is going to do 
is it's going to take all of the information that it has, it's going to merge that with preoperative information, and basically provide feedback such as information overlays, augmented reality, surgical navigation displays, and can do things like here's an example where what we're doing is interactively we're doing a finite element analysis to show the surgeon uh, in what's called an osteotomy as he's manipulating bone fragments what the implication of the biomechanics and the, the loading on cartilage uh, in a hip would be. Just a, a, a couple examples. Uh, here is a fairly typical augmented reality. Here, what we have is cone beam CT, where if I take x-rays moving all around the patient in the operating room, I can reassemble that to make a volumetric image. Uh, then I can register that with preoperative data and with navigation show where structures are here. The, the critical structure is where this is pituitary or transmit nasal surgery on the skull base, you don't want to cut the carotid artery. And so you want to know for sure where it is. And so this is what we're doing here. Now here's another example that I think is just cool. Uh, this is some work that Noah Cowan and uh, Nasir Nawab have been doing. Noah's main research is in bio and, yeah? You're talking about um, the possibility of cutting the carotid Yes, that's a hard problem. In this case, uh, we're doing it clinically, but like all of these registration systems, what well, you're still saying, surgeon, it's up to you. This is just extra advice we're giving. Th th this sort of display and <coughs> registration does seem to be better than what they do with a conventional commercial navigation system. But this is, this is a huge problem. Has there ever been a case where somebody made a mistake because they were and they blamed the system? And this could be oh, there are cases, I'm sure, where people have blamed the systems, and that's why professors get hired as consultants. Okay. Um, but uh, so it's a big problem, absolutely. Um, and, and let me come back to that at the end in, in some other examples here. Noah does a lot of work on bio-inspired robots, and one of the things he studies is the control of the electric fish that sends sent electric fields to know where they are relative to grass and muddy water. What Noah and Nasir realized is that if you put electric field sensing into a catheter, you could sense the local uh, configuration space of blood vessels and use that to help you navigate in inside blood vessels using much less x-rays than they normally would use in their interventions. So I, I just think this is cool. Um, here's another example uh, where here, again, a, a lot of what we're doing uh, more and more this relates to ultrasound. Here we have a snake-like robot manipulating an ultrasound probe on, on the, uh, the liver and we're using that uh, to guide uh, an ablation device uh, under ultrasound guidance to ablate a tumor. Uh, our colleague uh, uh, Cliff Burdett has a, uh, a very clever, uh, small, uh, high-intensity high focused ultrasound uh, ablation device that you can put into a catheter. Um, there's another ultrasound technique. It stopped me if I'm saying things that everyone knows, because I've got a lot to do, called uh, um, elastigraphy, where basically if you palpate with ultrasound and watch how the little speckles move, you can figure out the stiffness of the tissue. And uh, here, this is a case uh, where this is a patient case where we ablated a tumor. And as you cook, if you cook a tumor, it gets harder. It's like testing meat on a grill. And so this is the strain image. This is the conventional ultrasound image. And so you get much better indications of where tissue are. Uh, I'll come back a little later to one thing that we've been doing with robots for that. Uh, here's another example. Um, here we're using photoacoustic imaging with ultrasound. 
And one of the things, if you want to provide one of those augmented reality displays, the standard way of doing that is I track my ultrasound probe. I track, uh, say, a video camera, and I kind of subtract between them. And you have a lot of add-up of errors. Here, if you flash laser light onto the surface of an organ, and look at, that generates photoacoustic spots, so I have ultrasound spots, and I know where in my stereo video they, they correspond, and I can get some millimeter resolution registration that way. So it's a direct closure registration loop through the image guidance that you're then going to use to generate your video overlay. Um, of course, robots uh, are more and more used in surgery. This is the classical Da Vinci system. Um, surgeon sits at a console, uh, looks at the uh, patient through stereo video, he moves some control handles, and robot tools move, and it feels to him like he's inside the patient or her. Um, the crucial thing, though, uh, to realize is that what we've actually done is we've put a computer between the surgeon and the surgeon's tools and the patient. And so the research opportunities are how can we exploit the power of the computer to improve both the information channel and, and also can we affect the control of the robot to make it more precise, safer, more efficient uh, uh, for the surgeon. This is where a lot of the medical robotics research this focus now. Um, one of the earlier things that we did, this is, oh gee, uh, well that's 2011, but this was back 2009 even, is we, with intuitive surgical we make that big robot, we've uh, developed an ultrasound probe that you can manipulate with the, uh, with the surgical tools. And then here we're generating uh, various sorts of uh, augmented reality displays to help the surgeon see the ultrasound. But there are other things you can do. Uh, I mentioned that elastography. To get good images with elastography, what you have to do is you have to palpate very regularly. That's hard to do freehand. Uh, a robot is very good at that kind of motion. So what we have is the robot is told to do that motion and superimpose on it the motion coming from the uh, from the surgeon's control panels. And if you do that, this is a, a found study that we did, you can get very good uh, elastographic images. So this is one of the kind of things that in the future we're, we're hoping to get into clinical use. Um, here's another example of you on the information side. This is some work uh, that my grad student did with Intuitive, uh, where uh, the, the problem is surgery on the base of the tongue, transoral surgery. And what we were interested in is, can we actually use CT, cone beam CT, in the operating room with a dementia robot to help us do these sort of procedures? Uh, there is obviously a geometric problem of getting this big cone beam CT machine to work happily with the robot and we were only boundedly successful with that. But um, this, is, uh, this is a pig study uh, where we implanted a tumor into a pig and we're tracking the tumor on the base of the tongue. What we found is that just simply the augmented reality display by itself is not as useful as you might think. You need to supplement it with additional views to show you things like from the side view and if I let this run longer, uh, we also have some live x-ray. Uh, well, here you can begin to see some of the, the x-ray augmentation in there. One of the interesting things, uh, this is the results from a, an expert surgeon who does these procedures routinely. What we found is that without the guidance, uh, he couldn't actually get the tumor out of this pit. Uh, and where he could get good margins with the overlay. Now, in fairness to the surgeon, the anatomical landmarks inside a pig are rather different than in a human, but it's still suggestive of the kind of help that you can do. Uh, one thing I might just mention, um, 
when we started this work, uh, we were we, we and we also eventually did a lot of the experiments. This is a new robot that Intuitive has uh, FDA now approval to use, where all the tools, rather than come in like this, come in through a single path. And the idea was here, uh, the, the robot can more reach out like this, so it seemed more plausible that we could do things with x-rays. And um, I, I don't, and this was just one of the early experiments that we did. The main reason I'm showing it is to just, again, reinforce the notion that a lot of what you do in these various paths can be orthogonal to the particular design of the robot or system. And good, I'll come back to this theme later, good system design to allow you to factor things so you can reuse work across multiple platforms is a crucial uh, element of what we need to do. Here's another system uh, where, uh, where here what you're doing is you're using ultrasound guidance with some robotic assistance to get a consistent view uh, for um, radiation therapy. You can plan this procedure, you locate things with ultrasound, but then each time you want to come in, in with a fraction, you've got to get, to get the right alignment, you want to get the same ultrasound view, and you can do that with, with a robotic system here. And this is in pig studies down at our hospital. Final example on this information side, this is a thing that uh, Nasir is doing in our lab at Hopkins, um, where uh, you drop this little, this is a little Geiger counter, basically. It's a, a spectrum, it, it's a, it detects X-ray energy along a collimated path. If you wave it around over a target where you've, say, injected a contrast agent to find lymph nodes, cellular nodes, or a tumor or something, and wave it around, you can do a homographic reconstruction and again present a video overlay. Uh, they're currently uh, integrating this with the DaVinci and I believe the next goal is to dismount the studies with it. Um, so those are on the information path. Now, if we look at the action path, what we're trying to do, yeah? I have a question. CS Robotics has gone through this Oh yeah, sure. I, I mean, you use a lot of that stuff. In fact, literally, for some places, you're using a lot of that to look at the outside of a patient, like using Connects for doing that. Uh, okay. So yeah, you're aware of that. Uh, the visual conditions inside the body are a bit different. Uh, glare is actually a big issue. You're with a endoscope, even a stereo endoscope, your, your, your illumination is coming not from the sides, but directly along this path. I don't have slides on this, but one of the areas we're actually looking at quite hard right now are navigating endoscopes uh, in the nose uh, for, for sinus surgery to do direct video CT registration there. And um, one of the things that we're actually using is a variation of that algorithm, that, that, that registration algorithm I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, so if I, I have a few examples here. I, I, again, I'm wondering if I could have maybe picked a few others. But this is a new system that uh, uh, my grad student, who's just about to finish uh, this month, uh, Kevin Olds, has been working on. Uh, for some time. Uh, here what we wanted to do is see could we de design a robot whose work volume and characteristics were well tuned to head and neck surgery. There's a lot of surgery uh, from here to here, so you need a work volume about like that with fairly high mobility and high precision. Uh, this robot has about uh, 25 micron precision. Uh, it's not quite as stiff as I want, but, but I can show you. And here's another robot uh, just uh, for, for manipulating flexible endoscopes, which often you'll use, in this case, in, in the throat and airway. So here's a system 
which was a great learning experience. It's a very, very simple robot. Those who know the history of medical robots can think of this as an ESOP for flexible endoscopes, uh, where uh, we had actually um, FDA clearance to use this on patients. I'm hoping that gets started in the next month um, or two. And the idea is just to provide more stable and convenient visualization to the surgeon. But once we do that, now we can begin to do image processing and video to enhance the information from that video screen, which is the next step. And there, there's some research uh, we're doing in that direction. We've also, on the action side, uh, here's this robot I mentioned. This is cooperatively controlled. The surgeon and the robot both hold the tool, and there's a force sensor. So if I feel the surgeon pull on the tool, the robot just follows his hand. Of course, the robot is a robot. It is extremely stable, uh, very precise, uh, and you can also do things like constrain its motion. Uh, here, this is just one of the earlier tests we did. Uh, here, uh, we're following, this is the operation game. We have to follow that maze without touching the sides. So that's what it looks like. Uh, now here's what it looks like compared to freehand. Uh, this was an attending surgeon. Uh, so, uh, and I, later, I, I, I think I have a cadaver experiment I can show you in a moment on that. Um, here's uh, another uh, use of this robot. In this case, we're registering it to uh, preoperative CT on, uh, this is a cadaver. I apologize, there are a few graphic slides in here. If you're grossed out, close your eyes. Uh, and again, there's this cooperative control. And in this case, we've done this registration. We've planned an ideal path. And uh, we're constraining the path uh, so that uh, you, 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 you move down that path uh, Without, uh, without damaging surrounding tissue. And you, you, can, you, can, you can make the robot move on that path automatically, but generally we have what would be called a, a virtual fixture with varying degrees of hardness to uh, help uh, control the motion. Here the goal is actually to train uh, novice surgeons on what the right path is. Down the line we can begin to use it uh, perhaps for safety. Um, here's another example. Uh, in this case, uh, here, here we're doing the same thing open. And here this is suturing a chicken, chicken tissue uh, with the robot. Now here we had a problem that the needle holder is actually a little bit bent, so we weren't able to hold the needle as well as we could. Uh, but here you can see in a moment we'll, you'll see what it's like open or without without that assistant, and it's much more difficult. That in in some of these anastomoses it can take a, a skilled surgeon an hour to just join one vessel. Yes, I mean. Oh, this, uh, well, what, what the guy said was both the novice and the uh, experienced surgeon said they would use it tomorrow if they had it. Even, even with all its limitations, it's already significantly advantageous. Uh, we do have in mind uh, a next generation of this uh, same system uh, that would be human rated and would be a little bit more precise, a little bit larger work volume in the way. And I seem to. No, uh, they, they do feel like they're in control. Here, um, I'm going to just show this one slide very quickly. Here is, here is that. Um, this is the cadaver study from vocal cord. Um, there's a, your vocal cords, a couple, few hundred microns thick. And here, you, if, if you have a polyp on the vocal cord, you have to be very careful if you want that opera singer ever to perform again. And uh, so here, uh, basically, what was done is what, that we used the robot 
almost as a smart retractor to pull the tissue back and then the guy can cut it okay. But, uh, and this again is a case where Dr. this is Lee Ask, he's a, a voice surgeon in Hopkins. He said he'd use it tomorrow if it were FDA approved. So we're, we're, we're actually pretty, pretty encouraged uh, by that. I need to move on. Um, here's um, even another application um, of novel technology. Uh, here, uh, what the problem we're dealing with is what's called an osteolytic lesion, which you can get from various causes. Cancer is one, but also particles from an orthopedic implant can get in behind the implant, set up a reaction, the bone turns to mush up behind the implant there. Uh, if you leave that untreated, eventually the implant will fall out or you'll have a fracture, both of which at that point are enormously difficult to deal with. So what you'd like to do is curette out that stuff there and fill it with bone snack, uh, basically epoxy. Uh, the problem <coughs> is the implant, until it fails, is grown into the bone. It, 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 and if you try to get an implant out to get at that stuff, it'll fracture. Uh, and then you've got an even bigger mess. So uh, the goal is, can we develop a robot that, that can have high dexterity and enough strength to, uh, to reach in there? So here what we have is this is a nitinol robot where the tendons that control its shape are embedded in the wall. It's got a four millimeter lumen. And the idea is that we can pass uh, various tools like a shaver or a little brush, water jet, through that lumen uh, to, and then reach into this uh, cavity and uh, scrub things out. Uh, this is ongoing work. It looks like we can get significantly more of the group out than you can with conventional uh, rigid hand tools. And uh, it, you, you, it's a fairly complicated control problem. And there are other problems with how do you, how do you actually sense the, um, the bend because you can't just rely on the control wires. And so we have some schemes for dealing with that. I, I don't really have time to talk about now. There's some papers just going into ICRA about it. Um, the other problem is when you do the planning. You have this big metal implant and if you do CT scans, you get a lot of imaging artifacts. Well, um, that's makes it really hard to see the lesion and do your planning. Uh, here, it turns out, if, since you know the design of the implant, you can simultaneously register from the x-rays you're using for the CT to know where the implant is, and then once you know the implant, you can correct for the registration. And we've had a number of activities of, along these lines for, for a number of years. I did some early work, but this is the work of uh, Webb Stamen and Yoshi Ataki. And I think it is, they call it known component reconstruction. And it, it, I think it's just fantastic. So this is, will be what we'll be using uh, for the planning. One more um, orthopedic um, application. Gee, I am. Sir, I do quite understand the planning part of that problem. Uh, well, you need to know the shape of the cavity. <coughs> Uh, and um, you, you like to be able to use that as part of the control. Uh, you also would like to tell the surgeon where where that thing has gone relative to the cavity. Um, I am gonna. Is there a path planning part of that, or is it your use? There is. We haven't really done. We've done just a little bit there. Um, I had one student did a course project, but this is one of the things that we have to do more of going forward. Uh, you also have to, uh, there are manipulability constraints and all kinds of things. It's a really interesting set of problems there. Uh, is it okay if I go five minutes over? And I know Polina's going to leave, and I promise to poke at least one pen at all. The robot's good at that. But um, here, uh, what you have is, if you have a patient with osteoporosis, they can be at very high risk of a fracture up in their proximal femur that can literally put an old person into a death spiral. 
So rather than wait for that fracture to happen and try to repair it, why not inject some, something like cement into that proximal femur to reinforce the bone? And so we have uh, a project uh, for doing this. Um, uh, there's a planning component where you want to know where you're going to inject and based on biomechanics how much you think you're going to strengthen the bone. Then there is an execution component where uh, you need to use, in this case, X, we're using x-ray image guidance and a, either a robot or, or a navigated injection device to inject the cement. Then as you inject the cement, after you've injected it, you want to know the shape of what you've injected to verify that you've done the, uh, that you've, you, you've got the right strengthening and you know what you've done. Um, here's just an example of a um, cadaver trial we did. This is probably the most graphic slide I'll have to while you get kind of used to it. I mean, most engineers are fairly bloodthirsty for this. Uh, so this was a cadaver trial. It, it will go on uh, for a bit, but kind of shows some of the interfaces. Uh, this was done a couple years ago. And um, one of the problems is, well, how do I assess the cement? I could do a cone beam CT. That's a lot of radiation. You really need to take all those views. Uh, turns out that with just four views, this is more that like Lucas did uh, a few years ago. I think it's really clever. Basically, he found a way uh, to run 3D level sets off of 2D images. And uh, he's able to very accurately, with a small number of images, reconstruct the shape of the cement blob. And I, I, I just thought this was a really cool result. Uh, here's here would be what sort of the standard way. You look at the visual hull of these images and kind of intersect them with something like that. Here is what we got uh, with, with this shape. And here's the ground truth. So it's, it's, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better with a small number of images. Um, here's another problem, again, on this theme of integrating imaging with information. This is what one of my students did uh, for a, he finished about a year ago from his PhD thesis. The problem is to retreat, it was originally motivated by a request from the military. They had roadside bombs in Afghanistan, which were civilian problems. You get a particle uh, from into, into the ventricle of your heart. You gotta get it out before it makes it to the lung or on the other side, maybe up into the head. Um, so this particle is bouncing around. You can see the standard way to get it at it is open heart surgery. You stop the heart, put the patient on bypass, you cut a hole, you reach in, you grab the particle, you sew everything up, and then you hope the heart restarts. Uh, here what we wanted to do is use a snake-like robot to reach in there and under 3D ultrasound guidance, uh, grab the particle. Now the problem is that particle moves really fast. Uh, anyhow, here's what the, we've, we've only done this on phantoms. Here's the, here was the lab demonstration and the snake robot we used. Um, but, and it moves, you could try to make a really fast robot to chase the particle down, but that seemed to pose some safety problems. So uh, what we realized is that there, the flow in there is turbulent. You'll get caught in a, an eddy for a while, then it'll bounce out, go somewhere else, but if you watch, you can develop a probability map of where that particle is likely to be. And you'll see it'll pick the, the target. This is a visualization uh, from 3D TE ultrasound. So there's the target. Here's a robot coming in to grab the particle. So it's like a bass waiting for a minnow is the way I think of it. Um, one more robot example, which is the other project that we've had ongoing for many years has been in retinal surgery, microsurgery, where you're dealing uh, with structures uh, that are smaller than the hair on your head. Uh, you're, here, what we're doing is we're peeling a membrane of uh, scar tissue off the retina. It's like peeling sticky tape off of tissue paper without tearing the tissue paper. Uh, the forces between the tool and the retina 
are an order of magnitude smaller than a human can feel, and also an order of magnitude smaller than the forces between the white part of the eye and, uh, and the tool. And by the way, it's bad ergonomics, and you can't see very well, and you have hand tremor, often as large as the structure you're trying to deal with. So the goal of the research was to develop uh, a systems approach to address a number of the information sensing and manipulation challenges uh, to this sort of uh, procedure. And, and uh, here's what the lab bench set up here is. Our, our evaluations were done on rabbits, which are actually much harder to operate on than, than, than larger animals because of the way their eyes are structured. But they're a lot cheaper than uh, large animals, and so this is what we did. And again, we have one of these cooperatively controlled hand-over-hand -hand robots and various sort of force sensing. Here's one of the things that we're doing. This is a rabbit eye. Is as you move the eyeball under the microscope, you can kind of build up a mosaic, a, a map of that retina, which you can annotate with image processing. You can also register, like here's a preoperative fundus image that is registered to the uh, live image. And so we can, this gives us a way of relating preoperative to intraoperative uh, information. If we look at sensing, uh, one of the problems is you've got, because the forces are so small, and you have to have the sensor inside the eyeball. So you know, the tool is less than a millimeter in diameter. It's uh, 700 microns or 500 microns diameter. And so uh, you need to be able to sense. What we've been doing is we've been integrating a kind of a sensor called fiber gra drag grating, an FBG sensor, optical fiber force sensors into the shafts of these uh, submillimetric uh, surgical uh, tools. I can show you more about that later. What I just wanted to do is, uh, one of the things to me was really interesting is this is the first time we could actually even measure what the actual forces in surgery are. And so this is one of the experiments we did. What we found out was that a force of seven millimeters will tear a retina, at least in a rabbit. And that's a very small force. Uh, one of the things as well, <coughs> given that you took a systems approach, you could take the video, all the other sensor data, record it in a single system, and for post-operative analysis, uh, it is sort of like a video editor. And one advantage of putting focus on systems infrastructure <laughs> is you can you can, again, exploit these synergies to help you do even individual pieces of research like that force research better. <coughs> well, okay, one question is how do I tell the surgeon that force? Playing it back to the surgeon's hands, we can do that with the robot, but the surgeons hated it. They, they want the tool to feel transparent. Uh, okay, how about video? We could generate a video overlay, video sensory substitution. That seemed like a great idea. Surgeon hated that. And the reason was very simple. Uh, they said, look, I'm looking here. Now you're going to distract me with something there. Uh, so what we found uh, worked well was uh, auditory. And this is supposed to be playing, which is, <coughs> I thought is. I don't. So what, what we found is if you play a little tune based on the force, and you change the tune as you get close to a danger threshold, you can provide good feedback to the surgeon. Four, 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 you can three, also three, four, three, use four, voice three, two, one, one, three, four. Ouch, oh, oh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and it gives the grad student in the ouch, evening ouch. something to do with himself. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Okay, I mentioned forces on the retina, on the sclera as well as the retina. Uh, you, you, uh, one thing, if I've got two tools, especially the robot, I, I don't want to stretch the retina. So I need to know how hard I'm pulling on the retina and on the sclera, the white part of the eye. So if you build a force sensors on both sides of the tool, down below and above, you can estimate where the contact point in the retina is, and you can also control those forces. 
So uh, what you're seeing here is that you can automatically accommodate as the eyeball moves, you can shift the, the center of motion. Uh, and it was interesting, what we also found is that you could actually uh, trace, uh, this is on phantom, uh, uh, structures uh, much more easily and accurately. So there's, there's a bunch more here. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, yeah? I have a question about uh, the eye and the eye surgery. So if I understood correctly, you said that uh, the order of magnitude of the forces involved is one uh, below what humans can see. Below human threshold, yeah. But surgeons still perform that surgery. Yes, they primarily rely on visual feedback. So it's visual feedback. So that means that the visual feed there's information about... Oh, uh, yeah, well, they, they look at, at how this tissue is stretching, and they say, that ooh, that's stretchy as well. There is a hypothesis that if you control the forces, you can perhaps do things better. There's a hard hypothesis to prove. Um, there are other things that we're looking at as well, like we can figure out how much blue light has been exposed to each part of the retina. And our, again, we can make a, a map of that and have a hypothesis that starting to do some work to try to check that if you did that, you could uh, help a, a surgeon control the amount of toxic light to the retina and perhaps reduce the chance of a condition of light toxicity, basically sunburn in the retina. Uh, here, you can also build a thing like an optical coherence tomography probe directly into the surgical tool. And this is an interferometric technique uh, that, that basically allows you to sense both the structure, in this case it's along an A-line, and also something about the tissue spectrum. So here what we're saying is here's what we think is oxygenated hemoglobin in this chicken embryo. And by sweeping the um, probe across the tissue, we can get uh, structural information. Well, one of the key things you can do, though, is in addition to imaging, you, you know how close you are to the retina, and, and you can feed back uh, uh, into your robot to either go a particular depth into the retina or prevent a collision with the retina unless you really mean to collide with the retina. So this was an early experiment that we did with, with that steady hand robot. Here's some more recent work uh, that Jen Kang has done where you have a very fast handheld actuator, again using OCT and one-dimensional feedback. That's the actuator you're hearing. Maintaining, you notice that he's moving his hand up and down, you're keeping a constant distance here. Well, is that useful? Well, here's some reason to think it might be. Here we're trying to peel a membrane off the inside of a chicken egg. Just to back up, again, you can also do things like control injection depth and so forth. I'm part of this project, but the real leader is Jim Kang. Uh, putting some of these together, here what we're doing is we're scanning across, this is already a fairly torn up rabbit retina building up uh, uh, one of these uh, images, and then we can come back and just point with a tool and know what we have uh, with, with that part of, of the retina. So these are some of the kind of things you can do. Um, I've pretty well run, if I can go another five or eight minutes with your indulgence, I, I, I got started late and... You want, you want me to quit? Oh, yeah, this will be short. Well, let me just very quickly talk a little about this red loop. Um, here's some work that we did with uh, radiation therapy uh, planning. Uh, this is an extremely difficult planning problem to plan the machine settings, the beam settings uh, in a radiation therapy machine, put lethal dose onto the tumor, but not do too much damage to surrounding organs. The actual problem is computationally intractable. So what they do is they successively try to solve 
simpler problems that at 20 minutes or so on a workstation you can solve. You get a set of machine settings, you simulate the dose, and you look at it and then say, oh, that's no good, and you change, you tweak the problem that the math problem is solving. Uh, the, the difficulty is you don't really know where to stop. Uh, so what we did is we looked at the relationship between the tumor and the surrounding structures and we were able to get a geometric descriptor of that relationship that we could index a database of all the previous patients that we treated. What we would then do is, given a proposed plan, we would go to that database and say, was there a similar patient who should be at least that part of the plan, but whose sparing of surrounding organs was better, and if we found one, we would then use that set of objective functions in the simpler problem to get another set of machine settings, and a significant fraction of cases, you get a plan that was equally lethal to the tumor, but spared the surrounding organs better. The other thing you can do is, rather than start with something you can never achieve, you, you start out, you go to the database, you find a similar patient, and in one or two iterations, you can then get a plan, you show it to the physician, he says, our plan is better, or equivalent. So this is one example of the kind of thing you can do. Uh, what Greg Hager uh, does is he's also looking at what people do at motion from, in this case, Da Vinci uh, surgery, and is able to analyze just from the motions what little pieces of surgery are being done. So uh, here, uh, he calls this the language of surgery, and you can develop skill metrics like expert and novice. Um, here's some other work um, analyzing from, again, uh, video uh, workflow in an operating room. And I just, I'm almost done. Uh, I want to just come back and close on this theme of information integration and modular components. Um, this is that same picture, um, kind of more as a block diagram of what what the system looks like. And so here's the patient loop, and here's the, that process offline loop. And uh, what I want you to notice is that the basic structure is the same almost no matter what the application is. So what we've done, and we put a lot of work into developing uh, libraries and a component-based software architecture that lets us mix and match these components very efficiently. One really cool use case of that has been this. Uh, this was the first Da Vinci robot built out in the wild out of spare parts. Uh, and we were using this whole infrastructure for it. What Intuitive has been doing more recently is they donated uh, that same set of spare parts to 15 or 20 of the top medical robotics labs around the world. And we're all using um, basically the same uh, infrastructure of our, our software and control hardware. And to me, this is really very exciting because for the first time recently, we have first an architecture that lets us mix and match components, but also we can have shared hardware so that what I do at my lab could be replicated by, say, what Howie Chosett does at his lab or Alice Nakamura at hers. This is just one early example. This is Peter Veal and Tim Goldberg. What they actually automated uh, uh, a, uh, a surgical uh, snipping task. And, they, and I just thought this was cool. So I'm done. Uh, if we're going to do this sort of work, uh, the, the key things are you really need to work closely with clinicians and, and, and also industry. Uh, I honestly believe that you can do better technology research if you iterate on um, from an application, get an academic problem, you try something, and you rapidly iterate with physicians. You can't assume you know what they like and come back a year later because you'll invariably find you're wrong. And finally, uh, I, I, I've ended every talk I've given for about 10, 12 years with this slide. The reason I got into this uh, was I think there's a real chance that we can use technology to help people. 
in a very, very direct way. They're fun, they're terrific problems. I mean, you can make a good career out of it. But ultimately, uh, we can provide, transcend human limits uh, from that three-way partnership. We can, we can also improve things like consistency, safety, quality, and that's the real payoff. Um, and in the end, I think we can get more effective and, certain, and more cost-effective treatment processes. And so I commend it to you. And I apologize for going five minutes over, but I will point out I got started 10 minutes late. So, uh, And uh, I can take any more questions, or we can go get pizza, or whatever you're doing.
I think it's going to be a, a, a long time. You, and you only want to do that in cases where you think the machine can be better. What I do see happening is cases where there's some step that can be done better on local feedback. And so the, you can imagine a case where the human guides the robot to a place, and then the robot takes over and with sensory feedback, for instance, uh, it, when you're drilling into a thin bone, the robot can feel when it breaks through the bone and can stop. Or when you're trying to poke into a blood vessel, it can feel that and stop rather than go on out the other side. So I think that kind of thing uh, will be fairly common. Uh, I think other cases, uh, I, I, so I, I think it, it, this notion of shared autonomy is, is going to be there a lot before you, you fully say, okay, uh, here's the patient on the table, the robot wheels in and starts doing its thing. Uh, we have talked occasionally about a grand challenge uh, of demonstrating fully autonomous surgery on a pit or something like that. But it works for cars. <laughs> it works for cars. Yeah, well, it did. Uh, I, 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 uh, maybe I'm too much of an engineer uh, to go there. Yeah? So thank you so much for a great talk. Um, I'm more worried on mechanical or mm -hmm. robots. So are they, uh, can you uh, <coughs> put a couple of like, challenges in uh, building better robots? Okay. Uh, okay, the challenges are, what are the challenges for building better robots? First, just some observations. Medical devices have problems of cleaning, sterility, uh, and robustness, all of which are very, very important. And that, and if you're going to use a robot in an MRI machine, you have materials. Um, I think the other set of challenges have to do with scale. How do you get things smaller and smaller and smaller while still providing the strength you need? Tissue is actually pretty tough. And how do you integrate sensing force, chemical sensing, into the tool so that you don't need a whole separate sensor here? So I, uh, to me, those are a couple of the challenges. High dexterity is, is, is obviously something useful. Uh, you see these concentric tube robots or uh, the kind of snakes that Nabil and I have more spent our time on or other things. So high dexterity with high strength on a small scale is, is clearly still out there. Is there a rule for softer, more compliant? Uh, is there a rule for softer, more compliant? Sure. Uh, um, you'd like it to be softer and more compliant, but still able to exert the force when you want it to exert the force. But yeah, I, I mean, for things like retraction or for the part of the robot that is getting to the place where it needs to exert something, yeah, you, you'd like that to be a little bit floppier. The problem, of course, is once things are a little bit floppier, it's even harder to know the right Jacobian for the precise control that you want to do it. Yeah. So, um, do you see along the same lines of the, uh, the more design part? Do you see any um, um, like effect of the, of the recent like manufacturing revolution with uh, additive like three D printing um, in terms of maybe designing specific tools to specific humans to specific operations to specific um, instances? Okay. The question is. Uh, it is Rapid 3D prototyping having an impact. Yeah, absolutely. And there you see often papers of medical robotics for that. Um, um, there is a, a fellow at TU Munich, Ken Lu, who actually has an ISO 9000 uh, fabrication facility in his lab. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Where he will 3D print custom tools, in fact, he'll 3D print entire custom robots. For, for applications. Uh, I think also with these powder manufacturing, uh, the, the laser centering, um, you can get them very small feature sizes. And so I think there is a, a lot of potential there. I, uh, I wish I could afford in my private lab to have more of those, those machines. Uh, but yeah, I, I, think that, I think there's a lot there. Uh, one of the nice things about some of those processes is the laser ones, they heat things very hot. And so the part can come out of the machine sterile. And that could be actually very advantageous. 
and even the plastic ones, you have this big thing, you can sterilize the powder with gamma rays or something, and then, you know, the part comes out, it's hot, so it's sterilized. You blow off the excess, and now I have already a sterile powder. Then you get this. Yeah, you have to then handle it sterile. But yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's, uh, <coughs> actually I think that's very important. Also, given that you can fabricate flexures for single-use tools, I think that is really bad. That's perfect. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. And thank you for being such a patient audience. I, uh